ground all the wood of the trees, right? But it sterilized the soil to a depth of, you know, eight inches or something like that. Well, forget eight inches. The top, you know, four inches is where all the life is, basically, right? Okay. So they had to actually drop seeds from a helicopter. We created this sort of unnatural fire that seeds couldn't survive, right? Normally, seeds will survive. There are, in fact, trees that have seeds that open in a fire, right? There's a jack pine in Minnesota. grows kind of so it's mid uh, canopy and then dies and leaves its seeds on the tree waiting for a forest fire. When the forest fire comes through and, and crowns out because there's these dead trees that provide a bridge from the ground to the canopy, right? When the, when the fire crowns out, all the trees die and the jack pine cones open up. How's that for an uh, evolutionary strategy, huh? Like, ha! Ah, I'm going to torch you guys, <laughs> right? It's like, don't invite that guy. Don't invite jack pine to a party, right? You know? <laughs> This is crazy. There's other trees, the, the red pine in, the, in the, the northern forest in Minnesota, the bark is fireproof. Most bark is pretty fire resistant. And so uh, campers always find tree bark and try to start fires with it. It's funny. Let them try. It's kind of funny. It's like, yeah, it's not burning so well, is it? Birch bark burns. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, we did this to a city in Germany on purpose. There's a city called Dresden. The Germans weren't surrendering. We were bombing the crap out of them. Why won't they surrender? Why won't they surrender? So if we cause enough civilian casualties, they'll surrender, right? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Do we kill more people in Hiroshima or Dresden? I don't know, right? Um, but basically, firestorms. We just kept bombing this this old the old city full of wooden buildings until it firestormed, until it just flew out of control. People in the bomb shelters thought they were safe, right? But it, the firestorms killed because not because of heat all the time. They kill because they use up all the oxygen. So the people, all the you know, women and children, all the civilians that did what they were supposed to do and get in the bomb shelter, died because um, they, they, they didn't have any oxygen, right? Um, so you know, there we have it, right? Um, that's why you don't fight wars, kiddies. Because people eventually think of things like that, right? Um, this is if you're outside and you're losing a lot of heat by convection, that is, you've got a wind chill. This is the simplest thing, and, and you know, why not bring it, right? Okay, um, bring a windbreaker. Windbreakers are, are, can be packed incredibly small. You can get a parka about this big, right? You can just whip that thing out, put it on, and instantly you feel warmer. And the nice thing about having a windbreaker that's not a raincoat is that the moisture can get through it, right? So if you're just freezing your arse off, right, and because of the wind, you put that thing on and suddenly you're, you're okay. And if you're working hard, like climbing a mountain or skiing or something like that, the sweat, the inside doesn't get all wet, right? So I highly, highly recommend bringing just some sort of windbreaker that's not a raincoat, okay? Um, the heat sinks in the smoke box with the candle. We saw that, yeah, okay? This is a wind shell. These are wind pants. Don't forget your legs, okay? And this is something, this is a pile jacket. You can't really tell. It's called wind wall. <laughs> And, and uh, North Face makes them. Keenan just loves his wind wall. He, we grew out of his old one. He's got his new one, right? It's this really dense pile. Do you guys have, anybody have a wind wall? Dense, dense pile. They've woven the pile. Generally, a pile, wind goes right through it, right? But this thing's got an outside layer that's really, really dense. Or sometimes pile jackets will have like a little bit of uh, uh, fabric on them to provide some wind protection because pile is not very good for that, right? And then, you know, the wind chill factor, right? It's like, oh, wow. Minus 91. Don't want to go there. 60 mile an hour wind, really? Okay. And then the final uh, heat loss, right, is, is so, so for, the, for our cup of coffee here, right, obviously there'd be convection currents going like this. Cooler air would be creeping in from the sides, right, and it would be rising like that, right? And then the final one is, is evaporation, heat transfer by phase change. This is a cooling process. Uh, if you have a very low energy molecule on the surface of the of the gas, okay? Low energy molecules sometimes excurt into the gas. They'll go into the gas and go, whee, this is fun, back in the, in the liquid, right? Because it's attracted to the liquid surface. If one's got a little more energy, it might go, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. oh. Yeah, kind of a thing, right? You gotta picture that. You gotta, right? Kind of goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Right back in there, right? Okay, but if one, has enough energy, can it escape into the gas and never come back? Whee! There we go, right? Now, remember that in, a, in any fluid, you've got particles that are going slowly and ones that are going quickly. We saw this. I had a little shaker thing on the overhead. Remember that? Some are going fast. Some are going slow. 
Yeah, even of the same size, right? Now, on the average, which ones are going to leave the liquid? The fast ones are, yes? If the fast ones are always leaving, what does that say about the average of the ones behind, left behind? They are slower, right? This, so this is one way, a microscopic way to explain why evaporation is a cooling thing. Right? We're losing molecules to the air. We always lose the fastest ones, yeah, aren't we? We're not going to lose the slow ones. They're going to come back to us, right? Okay, so, yeah, there we go, right? To, to calculate the heat loss by evaporation, we have a formula. It's just Q equals ML. You just do the phase change thing, right? Okay. Uh, to prevent heat loss by evaporation, well, one example, they actually have swamp coolers. If you live in Moab, you can air condition with water. You just take water, evaporate it, and it instantly gets cools down to like 52 degrees or whatever the dew point is, right? Sweat. Your body sweats. The wind blows on you. Have you ever been somewhere really dry on a windy day and you sweat? And doesn't your sweat feel really, really cold? Yeah. This is crazy, right? Um, if you're outside and you want to keep, lose, keep from losing heat through evaporation, you want to wear some sort of a base layer. Right? That's what base layers do, is they just keep your skin dry. If you wear cotton and it's cold, right? cotton is basically the fabric of death. The people that they find who are dead of hypothermia are the ones that went off wearing the cotton sweatshirt and then the blue jeans. And then it rains, then they get injured, and they can't get back to the trailhead, and then they spend the night and they die. Because right? cotton is very good at cooling you. On a hot day when you know you're, you need to get rid of heat, like if I'm hiking in the desert, cotton is my friend. Okay, I know I need to get rid of heat, but I also have brought all my stuff that in case it gets cold and rainy, I can put that stuff on, right? Okay, so, so you know, there we have it, right? Here are some base layers, right? Obviously, you just want to protect your body. I don't know if you want to wear stirrup pants, so that might be a, 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 a statement you might not want to make, you know? Okay, and then they make this, if you go to REI, they make... Uh, they make really thin stuff. They got thicker stuff and thicker stuff. So if you're doing downhill skiing, you probably want a pretty thick stuff because you don't, you maybe don't get all that hot depending on the way you ski, right? Um, if you're, or maybe midweight, right? If you're cross country skiing, you probably want the lightweight stuff because you're just, you're basically just running, right? And then the final one is just radiation. Uh, and people always, when they say radiation, they think of like, well, right now they think about Japan. Right, and they think about uh, plutonium and cesium and iodine or something like that, right? Okay, here I'm just talking about infrared. Yeah, have you ever walked in front of a heat lamp like at Costco? They've got the like demonstration heat lamp and you're like, ooh, warm, <laughs> right? Why? <laughs> yeah, or like at, uh, at uh, Fred Meyer, they have the heat lamps shining down on the employees by the door in the winter. You ever notice that? Yeah, okay, that's what I'm talking about. Or how about, have you been to the, the Twalton bonfire? And you can't stand too close to the bonfire, can you? The air is cold, you can see your breath. You can go, and see that the air is cold, yet you feel blazing hot. How is that? How do you feel hot, but the air is cold? It's not conduction, it's not convection, because the air would be warm in both cases, right? It's not evaporating something and hitting you with the, right? It's radiating, it's hitting you with photons of, of not visible light, but of something called infrared, right? Which is what heat lamps broadcast. And this is a very powerful way to, to, uh, radi to get rid of um, heat. Okay, this is why you have to preheat your oven. Because when the oven's preheating, what is that? What's that burner inside the oven? What's it doing? Is it glowing red hot? Yeah, it's just like a broiler. Yeah. So when you when your oven is preheating, those elements are broadcasting radiation in there. If you stick your cookies in there when it's preheating, what happens to them? Yeah, even though the oven air isn't up to temperature, just like the bonfire, right? It heats your your tray to five bajillion degrees and you burn the bottom of your cookies and the top is raw. That's fun, isn't it? Anybody ever done that? Yeah, there we go, right? Okay, um, Rostrin tried to warm tennis balls using the kiln. Now this is a reasonable thing before you, before you uh, criticize him for using a kiln to warm tennis balls, right? Wet tennis balls are a real drag, yes? Yeah, kilns are n used not only to fire things fiery hot, but you can set them for let's say 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And you do that. When you fire stuff, you sit there and let them sit at 150 degrees for a long, long time to dry out the stuff that you're about to fire. Why? If you fire it when it's at least a little bit wet, what does it do? Does it go kaboom? 
Yeah, there we go, right? So you actually take the stuff that's already seemingly dry, you let it sit there at 150 degrees for like, I don't know, depending on how, how much of a hurry, for maybe a half a day or something.